good to see you all here this evening. And um, I, I was drawn to the story for tonight of Moses holding the rod of God's authority high. And while the rod was up, the battle was being won. But when he got weary and the rod fell, the battle was being lost. So I'm just going to share this scripture with you from Exodus 17, verse 8 following. Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, choose us some men, go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on each side and the other on the other side. Uh, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called its name, the Lord is my banner, Jehovah Nissi. For he said, because the Lord has sworn the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So in, in this passage, a well-known passage, we have uh, the enemy fighting. And it's interesting, the symbolism that is here of um, Moses, Aaron and her, the sort of priestly class, uh, going up onto a mountain. And in the Bible, the mountain is always figurative and symbolic of where God is, God's perspective. Uh, it's where prayer takes place. In Matthew's gospel, mountains are very important and he always remembers to mention them. So Jesus goes up on a mountain and prays before he chooses his disciple. In Matthew, he records the Sermon on the Mount Luke talks about another time that Jesus was preaching in the, a similar subject on the Sermon on the, on the Plain. And so uh, there was the Mount of Transfiguration, if you remember, where Jesus went up on a mountain and was transfigured and spoke to Elijah and Moses. And then you think of Mount Sinai, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mountains are very important because they speak of heavenly realities. So here we have the priests, Moses, um, up on a hill, surveying down below where the battle was taking place. And Joshua goes out and he knows that Moses is going to be on the hill with the rod of God in his hand. And as long as he holds the rod of God high, they are victorious but he gets weary and tired and, you know, he had to hold that thing up the whole day, all day, the battle raged and he couldn't do it. And so when he, uh, when his human weakness and strength failed him, you can imagine, can't, can't you, him holding it high and, you know, a bit like a, a weightlifter, <laughs> you know, and he, and he, and after a while his arms are getting heavy and as they go down, he's watching the battle and all of a sudden as, his arms get heavy, new strength comes into the Amalekites and uh, the Israelites start to back away uh, and he can, he can feel that the enemy is, preva is prevailing again. And so that must have been a very powerful thing for him to see this, that the battle did not depend on the swordsmanship or how good the men down there were with spears. I mean, a battle is a very confusing place, isn't it? Especially in those days. I mean, a very random place. I mean, 
man against man, army against army, a great melee of fighting and slashing and killing. And, um, you know, surely a battle could go many different ways, depending on the strength and the strategy of the uh, general and the different armies and what happens in the, the heat of battle. But, you know, according to this story, uh, what was going on down below um, in the end had nothing to do with all the energy and the strength and the battle and um, the fighting. But actually the focus of that battle was not on the warriors fighting down below, but the focus was on an old man because he was an old man, Moses, by, by that time. An old man on a hill with a stick in his hand. And when the stick was high, the, they prevailed in the battle, the Israelites. And when the stick was low, the others prevailed. I mean, think of it naturally, from a natural perspective. How can a stick high or a stick low affect the course of a battle down below in, in the valley? Think also of um, Joshua. Now, he wasn't up on the mountain. I think it must have been weird, hey, being up on a mountain, peaceful, in a sense, quiet, um, no enemies on the mountain. But you can see down below, and it must have been weird to see down below where you're safe and removed high up. But down below, carnage is taking place, battle is taking place. It must have been strange to be watching that. And yet all you're thinking about is what to do with this rod, this stick. And then Joshua down there, he's looking up. He sees the rod high in the distance and he sees that they're making progress. But then he looks and all of a sudden the enemy seems to be strengthening and breaking through. And so he looks up again and he can't see Moses and he can't, I'm sorry, he can't see Moses with the rod high up. And so this is an incredible picture. Now, the rod is the rod of authority. This is the staff, the rod, that right from the beginning, God identified in Moses' hands to be used as a sign and a um, symbol that God was with him and that he was carrying spiritual authority. So remember when Moses threw the rod down, it turned into a snake, and when he lifted it high over the Red Sea, the waters parted. And when the waters of Meribah were um, bitter, he put his stick in and it was healed. And so this, this, this stick, there's nothing magical about this stick, but it was the representation. It was the authority of God in his hand. And often we find in royalty uh, throughout the ages, um, they will have a scepter or a rod uh, that symbolizes the authority that they have. Even in the houses of parliament, they have a scepter, a, a big scepter, a rod. And that scepter has to be in place for parliament to be able to make any laws. If that scepter was removed, then no laws could be made. So that scepter, or that, if that's the right word for it, that big a uh, golden staff that lies there in the middle of parliament is, is symbolic, so symbolic of the authority of parliament to make decisions. It's so symbolic that if it's removed, they can't make any decisions. And so this is God's rod, God's, God's authority. And he was lifting it, lifting it high. And um, people often Look at this as a picture of intercession. It's the priests on the hill and they're not in the battle, but what they do affects the battle down there in the dust and the blood and the killing. But what they're doing with a stick, which is totally nonviolent, uh, got, you know, they're not going around hitting Amalekites with the rod of God. They're not striking people, they're not using it as a weapon. And remember, Ephesians 6 says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly, um, but they're, they're mighty for the pulling down of, of, strong, of strongholds. And so there's Moses. It's, it's intercession. 
he lifts it high for God to see. Because when God saw the um, the rod of authority lifted high, he empowered the Israelites. But when the rod wavered, the empowering of the Israelites wavered too. And so we have another this beautiful picture of uh, Moses and Aaron. Uh, sorry, Aaron and her helping Moses. And I wonder if Moses was a tall man. I wonder if he was taller than Aaron and her. Because the first thing they do is they get him to sit down on a rock. And, and at first I thought, this is a strange thing. Why did they record that he sat down on a rock? And then I realized that if Moses was tall and had his arms up and Aaron and her were sort of like uh, shorter, they'd find it quite difficult themselves to sort of like support his arms. But if he was sitting down, then they could easily just grab his arm to stand next to him, you know, and, and hold hold an arm. And it would be a lot easier than trying to hold someone's arm. And I've seen preachers um, illustrate this um, story. And the preacher usually stands with a big broomstick or whatever he's got and stands like that. And then he gets his assistants and they're like this ho holding it. And um, it's quite tiring, but it wasn't like that at all. It wasn't that they found out how to hold the rod of God in an easy way. And the rod of God was held in an easy way, a way that could be held with support all day long and all night long if necessary. And the reason was, was that there was a cord of three. It, Moses couldn't do it on his own. He could not handle the authority, even though he'd been given the authority, he could not handle the authority uh, by himself. It, the, the authority was too heavy, too much of a burden. It was it was it was too weighty for him to hold that authority until the victory came. He needed others to hold the authority high to to break through. Uh, if it was Moses by himself on that hill, then um, the battle would have been lost. But the other two, Aaron and her, they helped him. They helped him hold up the rod and the victory came through. Now, this is just such a beautiful picture of the power of prayer, the power of prayer. You see, prayer is supernatural and spiritual, as you know. So down there in the valley, they were beating each other up, killing one another, I mean, it was flesh against flesh. It was uh, warfare. But you see, when we pray, we have an incredible effect on what's going around us that, naturally speaking, you would think would be impossible. So when we look in the world and we look at violence or riots or warfare or politics, and often, you know, Christians... Uh, now, Christians should be in politics. In fact, there's two types of ministers. There's two types of calling to the ministry. There's calling to the fivefold ministry, but there's also a calling to represent God in the ministry of the state. So somebody that's called into politics who's a Christian is as much called into politics as somebody who's called into the full-time ministry, the full-time ministry, the fivefold ministry, you know, apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists. They're both calling. They're the two, two wings of God. God created two institutions in the world, the church and the state. Both come from him. Both can be corrupted and used for evil or for good. But the idea of state to bring uh, peace and security to society and the church to bring the gospel and discipleship. Both of these were equally God's ideas. And you see that very much in places like like Roman, Ro, Ro, Rome, uh, Romans. But Christians often think that or, that or act as if all the power is in the po politics. If all the power is in politics or all the power is in brute force or, 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 or these types of things. 
And so some Christians are, are believe that change comes politically um, and prayer is very low on the agenda because, you know, what does prayer actually do? You know, you can pray about it, but someone's got to get out and do it. But you know what? Prayer is more powerful than politics. Prayer is more powerful than econ economic power, uh, military power. Prayer is the most powerful weapon or tool, whichever way you want to say, that is on the earth today. Prayer changes things. Prayer is the slender nerve that moves the omnipotent muscle of God on the earth. Prayer takes from heaven and invades earth. So this picture of, of Moses shows us that prayer changes things that don't seem naturally to be able to be changed by prayer. It looked in the, in the battle, it didn't feel spiritual, but somebody was praying. And so when you see things going on in the world or going on in your town or city or going on in your church or going on in your private life or friends lives or work life. And, and it looks like all the power resides in your boss or what other people are doing and their decisions. And it just seems so random and, and maybe wicked and, 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 and against God and you feel powerless and, and, and you pray, understand that you lift up God's authority in prayer. Now, we don't have a rod to lift up, but we have the name of Jesus. And the name of Jesus is more powerful than even Moses's rod. So the name of Jesus, when you pray in the name of Jesus, you're lifting up the rod of God, the son of God, over every situation that you are proclaiming and praying in the name of Jesus over. The name of Jesus is the Christian's rod. But if we're going to use the name of Jesus, and I, maybe I'll speak on the name of Jesus one Tuesday, just the name. I may do that sometime. But enough for tonight to say that the name of Jesus, we can't, we can't use it just in a repetitive or unthinking or unbelieving way, almost like a mantra in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. And um, what one of the things that I, I, I often critique is how people pray. Now, God listens to the heart, um, not, not, not to how wonderful somebody sounds in prayer, oh Lord, I know that. But what I'm, I'm not talking about about that i'm talking about thoughtful prayer with faith and sometimes when people get in their prayer mode prayer mode be careful of prayer modes there may be a prayer flow but be careful of prayer modes i've been in enough pentecostal prayer meetings in my life to know when people just go straight into a prayer mode in my background it would be just speaking in in tongues not speaking in tongues or just shouting 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 and that was their prayer their prayer mode they weren't thinking or mixing necessarily their faith with what they were doing this is what we do in our prayer meetings this is our style but if style doesn't have substance and faith is the substance of any style that we have if style doesn't have substance, it's meaningless, it's vain, it's, repeti it's repetition. And in charismatic Pentecostal circles, we have to constantly ask ourselves, are we just uh, moving in a style? Or, and I'm not bothered about styles, as long as there is a substance there, a faith, a belief, an understanding, a thinking, a grasping hold of the issues, and a grasping hold of God with words, because words are important. When you blabber, 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 I'm not talking about, but blabbing, oh, blah, blah, this, and then, then are you even thinking what you're saying? When I, when I help people prepare for public praying on the platform, one of the things I often notice 
with them is that sometimes they're over repetitive. I know God he hears the heart, but it doesn't mean we can't even think about what we're saying. And one young uh, pastor went out to pray for the first time publicly pray prayer. And it was from the heart. It was good and everything like that. But when he came down, I said, do you realize that you said Father God 22 times in that section of prayer? He said, no, I didn't. He said, you, did, you said Father God this and Father God that and Father God, we pray that we do this. Father God, we do it down. He said, yes, Father God and Father God. And I said, I said, yes, you did. I said, um, imagine if you if you addressed me and you were like, well, Bruce, how are you doing, Bruce? It's good to see you, Bruce. It's a lovely day, Bruce. So, Bruce, um, is there any way you can help me, Bruce? Because it'd be really good, Bruce, if you could help me, Bruce, because I'd really, Bruce, like you to help me. I'd be like, I heard you call my name the first time. OK. And the fact that he didn't know and then, you know, he didn't believe me. So he went up into the video gallery to watch him praying. And he came down and said, I had no idea. And I said, I said, I, there's nothing. I'm not saying that God didn't hear your prayer. There's nothing wrong with your heart. But you're not even thinking or aware what you're saying. And if you're not aware what you're saying, how can you mix faith with it? So you can have a prayer flow, but at least, you know, understand what you're saying and, 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 and speak with faith. OK, so the name of Jesus is not just a thing we say, oh, in the name of Jesus, this in the name. of Je And sometimes when you hear people, just name of Jesus, that name of Jesus, this name. Of I'm thinking to myself. You don't sound like you are right now consciously aware of the power of the name that you are speaking you sound like you're just using it because that's what we do we pray in the name of jesus that's what we do stop understand that the name of jesus represents the sum total of who jesus is what he's accomplished and what he's doing now you are coming in his authority when you when you come in the name of a king or the name of a government or or, the, or a policeman comes to you in the name of the law, not only does he come to you in the name of the law, but he has the authority and power to enforce the law and lock you up if you've done wrong. So when we come in the name of Jesus, when we're in the name of Jesus, we prophesy, or the name of Jesus, we speak to the Father. We are coming in the fullness. We are coming, we are on behalf of Jesus. OK, we're coming in his name. There's no other name. You know, we, we say this, we sing this and we believe it. But we need to be more conscious of it uh, when we're praying, lifting up the name of Jesus, the rod of God. Um, you know, uh, there is no other name greater than the name of Jesus. We mean the authority, don't we? That's what we mean. Jesus, the name above every other name. So that's our authority. And when we lift his name up in prayer to the father, we're coming with authority in his name. When we declare God's word in his name, God's will in his name, we are lifting up the rod of authority. We are coming on behalf of Jesus with his authority and we are lifting his name and it is releasing power, even if we can't see it uh, 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 at all at the at the beginning now sometimes we go to father go to father in the name of jesus and we don't see things happen immediately and sometimes it's because god is or is is working according to a plan sometimes we've made mistakes haven't we we've gone to the father in the name of jesus for something that jesus didn't want to give us or didn't want to give us quite yet and we didn't understand. We just said, in the name of Jesus, I'd like a new Ferrari, please, Lord. A nice red Ferrari, Father, in the name of Jesus. And there's some people that, that almost teach that you can take the name of Jesus and ask the Father for whatever you want in his name. And he will give you. But to pray in his name is to pray in his will. So sometimes we make mistakes, genuine mistakes. Um, and that's not a problem, not a problem. But other times we're, we're, we're using the name and we're praying in the name of Jesus, bring revival. In the name of Jesus, Lord, push back the darkness. In the name of Jesus, 
you know, bring a healing revival, whatever we're praying in the name of Jesus, we're lifting the rod. But sometimes, uh, even when we're conscious of the authority that we had, I mean, uh, Moses was conscious of the authority that he had. He didn't say this old stick, this old stick, lift it up. Why would I do that? Oh, this is just old stick. Prayer, prayer. I can pr name a Jesus. How can that move anything, let alone governments and nations? Well, we recognize the authority that we have. And when we pray, we, pr we mix it with faith in the name of Jesus. And that is what releases God's power through our prayer and declaration in Jesus's name. But <clears throat> often <clears throat> we don't, sometimes we do, we don't immediately see the effects of what we're doing on the mountain. And we get weary, we get weary. And um, let me just quickly share you, share another scripture that I had in my mind linked to this. Luke 18, <clears throat> Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not faint. I, um, I, I changed uh, not discouraged to not faint in this. This is, the, this is the New King James, but I like the Old King James, not faint. And then he speaks about the judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And a widow in that town kept coming to him saying, grant me justice. He refused. But finally, he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I'll give her the justice that she wants so she won't come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to the what and just the unjust judge said, I will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night. Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. So we have to understand that like Moses, we need to pray through. We need to keep praying. And you know, you will, you will have prayer faints. You will faint in prayer. Don't worry about it. It's about growing with God. You will, you, you will have prayer faints. Hopefully they'll get less and less. There will be times when you feel like giving up praying because nothing's happened. When it's overwhelming, when you look at the world or whatever's around you and or praying like Mark mentioned earlier, perhaps for a healing that's, that this doesn't seem to be happening. And you will get faint and you will give up at times and you will stop praying at times. And, um, you know, you don't have to fear that. We're not under law. But what you do need to do is pick up the rot again, pick up prayer again, go back again, take the name again. I've been in times where on certain situations I've prayed for or circumstances, nothing's happened, felt like I've prayed so long and I've got discouraged and I've fainted and I, and, and I haven't prayed for that situation for weeks or months uh, because I've just like lost faith really or been discouraged or whatever but then you come round again the Holy Spirit encourages you and you don't beat yourself up you just pick up the rod in that area again and pray and Moses was weary and Moses was tired but but even when even so he put it and the last thing I want to say about not giving up when you do give give up when you've had enough and your arms are down on a sub on a particular situation or nothing seems to be changing uh, remember the widow um, she got a result from, from the most ungodly judge you could think of. God is hearing. God is acting. God is down there in the battle. And uh, you just keep on praying and believing and picking up that, 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 um, that rod of authority as much as you can. But you know what? And this is where I, I want to finish the next two minutes. You can't do it on your own. You can't do it on your own. You can't. You're not you're not as strong as Moses, if I can put it that way. And he was a strong spiritual man. You can't do it on your own. You need when when two or three are gathered in my name well, they were gathered in his name, oh, weren't they on the hill with the rod of authority? You can't do it on your own. You have to pray with with one another. You have to share your prayer needs. You, 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 you have to be engaged in more corporate prayer. When, when you get the opportunity. I can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. God never intended us to do it, do it alone. Sometimes, you know, it's someone's prayer for you that changes things. And that's what God wants. Because 
God is concerned that we are a body. We're a body. We're not just individuals with our hotline to God. I have my hotline. You have your hotline. I'm on God with my mobile phone. You're on God with your mobile phone, but we're not connected. It's not like that at all. There's an openness where we share, pray for one another. You know, one person's not going to um, turn Britain back to the Lord on their knees. Many people will. And God intends it that way. God wants us to pray for one another. And that prayer for one another brings power into that situation. I just, I end on this testimony. Last week when we broke into, broke into our um, prayer groups for 20 minutes, as we do for those that want to, um, we were just giving our prayer requests. And so I just said, look, I've got quite a busy week in, in the sense that I have to um, plan for a singles ministry on Sunday. And I've never uh, really done that before. I need, I need it good. I also need to look at um, some uh, life group agendas for the next series for our life groups. And we're doing something different on time alone with God. And, I ha- and I'm trying to get a hold of that and, and shape that. What's it going to look like? And I said, you know what? It, it just could be a lot of effort and, and a lot of, you know, it, I've got to really get my head around it. So people just prayed and said, Lord, give him wisdom, give him help and everything like that. And then when I went to do it, you know, I just felt like a wind behind my sails. I just, things just came to mind. It was easy. It was easy. No, it doesn't mean that everything's always going to be easy when you pray for it, but it was. And I thought to myself, and it wasn't me imagining, I thought to myself, this is a direct result of being prayed for couple of people held up my arms in this particular thing and now I'm just steaming through it I just it's just so easy and it's not always easy even when people pray for you but I think God was showing me and maybe allowing me to share today that whether it's easy or not the prayers are having an effect the prayers are having an effect we need to lift up one another's arms We need to look out for our brothers and sisters, as we heard earlier about mental health issues, etc. We need to pray for one another. We need to pray for one another. Because when you pray for somebody, it has tremendous effect on their lives. And you might feel, you might not even be with them when you're praying for them, but they come to mind or you think about them and you pray for them. And it feels like you might be a long way from them when you're praying for them, almost like Moses up on the mountain. And they might be out at work or studying or in another nation or persecuted group of Christians or whatever. They may be a long way and they may be in a big battle, a big battle. But because you're praying for them, you're lifting up their arms or or strengthening them in their battle by by lifting the authority for them. You're, You're like you're helping them in the battle, but you're also helping them as if they were Moses by strengthening them. So think of this picture of the battle below that was so carnal and fleshly and earthly and the rod that was up on the mountain and the effect that that intercession had. But it needed help. It couldn't be just one person. And think about the Christian rod of authority, the name of Jesus. The next time you pray in the name of Jesus, think about what you're saying. It's an incredible uh privilege but it's an incredible power also to speak as a believer father in the name of jesus or to speak into into a situation let god's kingdom come in the name of jesus to our city of london let god's will be done in this elections in the name of jesus let god's will be done in america at this time in the name of Jesus. Whether it looks like it's worse or better or worse, you know that sooner or later, what you're doing will tip the balance. Remember in prayer, there's always a tipping point. Some of you need to write that down, make a note. There's always a tipping point. You push, you push, nothing seems happening. We're praying, we're praying, nothing seems to be happening. More people pray, more people pray. Still nothing's happening, but you don't realize it's reaching a tipping point. And then all of a sudden, the breakthrough comes. 
comes. All that time, this momentum's been building in the name of Jesus. More and more people praying, praying. Doesn't look like anything's happening. Doesn't look like then the tipping point comes and uh, things change. 